Did you know that about 90% of startups fail and 10% of them fail within the first year? About half are gone within five years. Well, let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk because I didn't bring up those numbers to depress you. I brought them up because we're going to be hearing from a guest who can help you defy those odds. A pocket-sized pep talk, the podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jealous. Today's guest, Brian Will, is a serial entrepreneur who's had a hand in creating seven very successful companies in four different industries worth over a half a billion dollars at their peak, and a business and sales management consultant to companies from startups to Fortune 500s. He's the author of The Dropout Multimillionaire, 37 business lessons on how to succeed in business with no money, no education, and no clue. And now you know why I booked them. Glad to have you with us and welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. And yes, that was me. No clue when I started. <laughs> well, you're talking to an entrepreneur, so we'll be able to swap some stories there. <laughs> but with you, I want to dive in. I, I, I do. I think it's a gutsy title. Uh, but And we'll we'll break it down. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I always thought of starting a podcast called A Book Finds You. Because rarely um, do we find the book. So what drove you to it? What made you want to write this book? You know, it was my second book. The first one I kind of started out to write for my kids. And, and some people love this title. Some people hate it. But my first book's called I Give the Dumb Kids Hope. <laughs> and there's a big story behind that. But it's, you know, I was a high school failout, managed to graduate with a 1.2, didn't go to college, didn't have any education of any discernible type, and yet went on to, you know, create businesses and be successful. Well, then after doing all this and doing all this consulting, I started noticing the same failure mechanisms in every small business that was out there. You know, you use the term that 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 90% of people are going to fail. 500,000 people a month start a business in America. That's 6 million a year. And by your numbers, four and a half million of them will fail. That's four and a half million people every year who are going to fail because in my estimation, they make some of the exact same mistakes. And that's what I kind of wrote the book for. Yeah. You know, I, I help, um, I'm 13 years in um, helping people in career transition. I, I sometimes think that part of those numbers, and it's, it's just a, a slice of it and, and be interested in your opinion. I think some of those numbers are due to the fact that when people are struggling um, and to find work or, you know, frustrated with what they're doing, so they don't want to do it anymore. The knee jerk reaction is I'm going to start a business. Yep. And they're completely ill prepared. I mean, you know, and, and I tell people when I'm coaching and counseling them, I love the idea. We'll start a business. The only time we're not going to start that business is right now <laughs> while we're, while we're, you know, trying to keep this raft afloat. But I, right. I worry that some of it is just knee jerk. I'm frustrated with my boss. I haven't thought it out. I'm just going to go. I got a whole chapter in the book, Rob, where I, I talk about the fact that I will try to talk you out of starting that business because here's what I know. I know that the, that the amount of crap that's going to come at you, the problems, the struggles, the, the, the stress, the family issues, if you're not really willing and prepared to handle that, then you should have never started that business in the first place. So if I can talk you out of it, you never should have started. If I can't and you get mad at me, okay, now I might have something here. <laughs> it's great. Uh, you know, it's funny. We're, we're, we really are. I, I see myself in you. I was always <laughs> I'm feeling a little guilty, but um, I just think there's a time and a place. And I just worry about that knee jerk reaction. Then the second question I get, and I'm curious how you an answer it is, they'll ask me, well, what's the most important person in your business? And uh, my answer is your accountant. Because <laughs> yeah. when I started, I, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'll figure all that out. And I was just getting fined left and right. I, you know, I was late with this, never even heard of that. What's that mm -hmm. license called? So uh, really an accountant to me was the first one who said, and a good one, I wasn't looking for a bargain basement accountant. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, you get what you pay for, right? I, I can find a cheap one and I'll get fined all year. So yep. we uh, call this knowing your numbers. If you're uh -huh. in business and you don't know your numbers, you're dead in the water. And I've acquired a lot of businesses over the years. And I am amazed every time I walk into a business. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, you want me to buy your business? Give me your last 24 months worth of P&Ls and let me take a look at it. And eight times out of 10, these small business owners go, well, I don't really track that. I just fill my receipts in a shoebox and my, my bookkeeper fills in the numbers for me at the end of the year. And I'm like, how can you be in business if you don't know what you're doing? 
Yeah. It's just, it blows my mind. So yes, know your numbers. That's an accountant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you get a good accountant and I'm not giving out my name here, but uh, my account would not put up with that. My account is QuickBooks <laughs> literate yep. and I got things I have to send. And, and that really helped me also. Cause I remember as a kid watching my parents literally fill the shoe boxes up. Yep. And I, I think I was eight or nine years old already fearing taxes. You know, if that's what it looks like, but we thank goodness we live in a time now where uh, really, if you keep things electronically and mm -hmm. you have, an, you know, and you've got a relationship with an accountant who understands it, you actually never have to physically be in the same room and they've got yes. your shoe box. Yep. That's exactly right. Yep. You're exactly right. So, so the, um, I got the no money, I got the no education, but the no clue. Yep. I don't want to, neither one of us want to squash an entrepreneur's dreams here. So, so mm -hmm. let's get them out of, let's, let's get them out of jail. The time is right. Somehow they want yep. you know, this is a good time. Uh, walk me through the no clue part. How do you help somebody with no clue? So here's what I talk about, right? So when you're starting a business, everybody's going to start their business at a different level, right? I call it people like me start your business at minus 10. I had no education, no idea what I was doing. I was clueless. Some people, they might have an MBA, they might have some venture capital backing, their parents were very successful, they got friends that are business people, they're starting their business at plus 50, right? We all start at a different level based on what we know, our knowledge, our background. What you need to understand as a business owner is that if you're like me and you're at negative 10 when you start, you're going to have to go through a lot more learning and lessons than the person who started at plus 50. That doesn't mean you can't succeed at the same level. In fact, you can make more money and have more success than they can. But you got to understand the number of lessons and the teachings and the things you're going to have to learn and the failures you will probably have to go through to get to that level. So understand where you are. I had no clue. I failed for 15 years before I finally figured it out. We just need to figure out where you are in the mix. And by the way, there's a way to fast track that. And it's get a coach and a mentor and somebody who is 10 steps ahead of you. They can go, no, 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 no. Rob, you're about to drive off the cliff. Stop doing that and do this. And this is one of the biggest failures I see with young entrepreneurs. Their ego is too big to get help. If you just bring somebody in to coach you and mentor you, you can avoid a lot of those problems. Okay. Now, do you know of a, of a redheaded coach anywhere? I know one. He's pretty good. I'm just saying. <laughs> He's looking at me, folks. Uh, how do people get a hold of you? Because uh, I, let, let's not bury the lead. We'll put that in at the end too. But um, I totally agree with you. I was actually just at a lunch with one of the top realtors in the state of Virginia and a, and a person who's uh, uh, from another country and just got their license. And, uh, you know, this person, the first thing that she said was, I found a coach. I found somebody who knew what I'm doing Good. and uh, just helped me go the line. So I firmly believe in that. So how do people get a hold of you? www.brianwillmedia.com. That's my website. Everything's okay. on there. All right. And the good news is I've seen the spelling of his name. Just like it sounds, because I get people like, yes, Brian will, but there's a two Y's and a, and a J in there. And an S uh, on the end. Yeah, B-R-I-A-N-W-I-L-L. -L. -L. So he's easy to find there. Uh, okay, good. And, and you know, I, I do want to go back on one thing you said, because, you know, that story is very compelling about, you know, the, the GPA that wasn't quite there. But I'm a, I'm a half full guy. And I think um, I, I my GPA was higher than that. <laughs> but it was through scraping and hustling and reading things four times. And, uh, you know, at that, when I went to school, we really didn't label people as much as that was the guy that's got to read it more times. Right. Uh, but I think, and just curious, I think maybe somewhere that ta taught you how to fight, taught you how to grind out and work a little harder. Things didn't come up, apparently didn't come easily to you. So I, I sometimes think that's, can be an asset to people when we've struggled early. You, you, you'd be surprised how many very successful people struggled in their early life, whether it was through, I, can't, I grew up in an abusive home. I had ADHD like crazy. In, night, in the late 70s and early 80s, we didn't know what ADHD was, right? right. We just said that, that kid's dumb, which right. was me, right? right. Unknowing that, that ADHD, while it was a weakness then, it's, it's one of my strongest assets today because I can multitask at a very high level across multiple platforms and let the people that work for me do all the detail work. Yeah. But because I'm ADHD, I'm all over the place, but I'm also in tune with a lot of different things where if I try to get down in the dirt and do it myself, forget about it, I'm going to fail. Yeah. So glad you said that. You know, there's a, there's a phrase that I've always been fond of called, we all walk with a limp. We've all yeah. got something. 
you know, yep. and a lot of times at the end of the day, people aren't nearly as concerned about your limp as you are. And as long as you don't make it a big deal and you basically learned how to you to create it, make it an asset for you, it doesn't it doesn't hold us back. So you just heard a great story there. Don't don't let we don't let things like that hold you back. And there's only two people who don't have a limp. That's somebody who is not being truthful with you. <laughs> uh, or somebody has no capacity whatsoever to have empathy for another human being. And quite frankly, those aren't the ones that I'm having a cup of coffee with. So uh, right. good. All right. Let's keep pushing forward. Love that story. Let's uh, roll. Okay. In your opinion, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of businesses that are failing out there and maybe we've tapped on it, but uh, compartmentalize a little bit. Uh, one or two, you've got 37 business lessons there. Maybe we just cherry pick a couple, but, how about a couple that relate directly to the failure of businesses? Sure. So I'll give you the, the very first chapter of my book, and it's about your personal filter, right? And it talks about the fact that everything that's gone into our brain since the day we were born has created this filter that's kind of a subconscious thing that you don't think about or even know is happening. But it's back there, and it filters every bit of information that comes at you, right? So everything that comes at you, including people listening to me right now are thinking I'm crazy because their filters are rejecting what I'm telling them. And some people are going, oh my God, that's gold because their filters are accepting it. And that filter then determines how you're going to react to every decision you make moving forward. So that's the basis. Now think about this person who's new in business, who's never been successful in business before. The fact is, if you've never been successful in business, you don't know what you're doing. Your filter doesn't know how to process information. It doesn't know how to make the right decisions in business. And because of that, we're going to go right back to this. You need to find somebody who could come in and help you make those successful decisions so that your filter will start to become a success filter in whatever business it is you're in. If you've never been successful, you don't know what you're doing. You need some help. That's rule number one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's almost like, you know, writer to writer. It's why we get readers to, to read our book. Okay. Uh, yes. we, you and I can read our own book 50 times and miss some of the most obvious things that are very simple to us, but people don't, they haven't, they haven't repeated in their heads 400 times. Right. Uh, so we're blind to a lot of things yeah. like that. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons why we get readers, we get other people to look at it who know nothing about what we're doing. They, most publishers, <laughs> just so you know, will send out a book to some readers and mm -hmm. you, you, as authors, you got to have thick skin, but that's the person you want reading it. If if they don't know a, a business from a hole in the wall and they can understand what you've written there, you wrote something pretty good. Because yep. as we both know, simple is a lot harder to write than complex. You know, yes. the, the stars are the ones that take complex. And I'm thinking also you as a business coach, when you can take complex thoughts and make them simpler to understand, you didn't wake up with that. That takes a couple, you know, a decade or two to, to start learning. But that's the value. And I, I, I did eight years in the military, four Air Force, four Army. And one of the things we were taught in the military is you teach everything at a fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. Every time you're talking to somebody, teaching something, learning a new skill, you do it at a fifth grade level so that there's crystal clarity in what you're saying. I've even heard today people say third grade level because of, and I use this example all the time, Rob. Yeah. And I, have you ever been talking or you ever been listening to somebody and they're talking? And they say something you don't understand. What does your brain do? It stops. Right. And your brain starts trying to figure out what they said. And by the time, this is a sales technique, by the way, by the time your brain figures it out and you catch back up with the conversation, you might have missed two or three or four minutes. And now you're lost in the entire process. The problem was not you. The problem was your speaker or your teacher was talking about things that you didn't clearly understand and got you lost in the process. That's the thing you got to be careful of. Don't lose the customer. Don't lose the person you're teaching. Teach at a fifth grade level. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said fifth. I don't know if I can live with a third grade level. <laughs> I, I, you scared me there for a moment, but I think I think we can all live with fifth. And and again, you, before we we make fun of that, I'm telling you, there's a skill to get it to that level. That's mm -hmm. where the good ones. Uh, they it, it takes practice yes. because uh, we're not talking like children. We're just taking the known and tying it to the no unknown. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's an art to that. So, yeah. uh, you know, we, we smile when we hear that, but, but trust me, it's a whole lot harder to speak at that level than it is to take it up a few years. This is a difference between an average salesperson and a phenomenal salesperson. Yep. You don't lose the customer in the process. And by the yep. way, 
one of my favorite things to tell salespeople is shut up and stop talking. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's uh, you know, I, I do two day workshops on sales and I'll go into decision cycles and trial closes, objection, only tactics, closing up, you name it. And yet I've had people come up after two days and look me in the eye and say, for the rest of my life, I am committed to asking questions and listening, and I'm going to keep my questions open early. And 100%. I'm never going to lose that lesson. And part of me always goes, oh, that's all you got. And the other part <laughs> says, if I could look in the future and you made that and you kept that promise, you just went to the best sales training program yeah. you will ever attend. It's yes. that important. So you're not losing me on that one. The more that other person talks, generally, the more they like us. Yes. Yep. That's a fact. It is a fact. And yet, like it's instinct versus logic, Brian. It's a fact. And I, I, I guarantee you, somebody's driving the car right now going, yeah, that one again. But I'm telling <laughs> you, I'm not, we're not, Brian and I aren't telling you what we're, what we're talking about isn't logical. It's not instinctive is the problem, particularly with salespeople who are getting sales trained, but really product trained. Thinking yes. they're being sales trained, yes, and they're going out and spitting back. I was a copier jock, speeds and feeds, you know. Um, yes. and thinking I just took my class. How could I be good doing this wrong? Yep, there's a proverb, by the way a man is considered a genius until he starts talking. <laughs> After that, it all goes downhill. <laughs> I paraphrased, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like your paraphrasing. <laughs> all right, we all want to be successful. Um, so give me a couple of ideas. Um, to build value in the business. Listen, April, I'll be 30 years as an entrepreneur. I worked mm -hmm. for me longer than all the other companies they ever worked with uh, combined. Uh, okay. I think some of the things I'm doing, I, I have to do a few things well, but some of them I, I fear almost are unconsciously competent, meaning I'm doing them. I might not even know I'm doing them. That's why I love mm -hmm. having conversations with guys like you. Cause believe me, part of the, part of the audience right now is picking up some tips on things. They went, boy, um, I knew I needed to work on that. And others are thinking, I I've been doing that, but I didn't know it was called that. And that's a value too. So a uh, couple of ideas to build some value in this business. So I'll, I'll give you one. Um, and it really depends on the size of business and what the end goal of the business is, right? I talk about the difference between being an entrepreneur and being a business owner, because those are two different things. They have two okay. different daily things that you do, and they have two different end results. So I talk a lot about a business owner, somebody who's building a business that's going to have intrinsic value that one day they can sell, right? So if I'm talking to this person that wants to build value in a business, then what I would tell you is that you need to check your ego and not try to be everything to everybody on every matter, okay? And let me bring that back a step. You need to bring the right people in that are strong where you're weak and then allow them to do their job. And in fact, you need to allow them to fail so that they can learn how to do their job better. Too many entrepreneurs bring people in. As soon as they fail, they want to, you know, want to throw them out, uh, you know, trash them. That person failed. They're no good. No, no, no. As a, as a business owner, that was an expensive lesson for you. Why would you throw that expensive lesson out and have to learn it again with the next person? Let your people fail. Let them learn. And then let them be able to take over all the areas in the business that you can't or don't want to do. Or, quite frankly, you're not good at. Everybody who starts a business is not a CEO. And this right. is another tip, right? Just because you started the business doesn't mean you're a CEO. You could be the specialist that goes out and does a physical work. You could be the manager that manages the office. You could be the salesperson that sells the product or the vision. But salespeople make terrible CEOs. Managers make terrible salespeople. Technicians make terrible entrepreneurs. So figure out who you are in your business. Figure out what you're good at. Bring the right people in to fill those other roles. And that's what will allow your business to grow. Then let them fail and learn. And that's what will allow you to develop a lifestyle over time. It doesn't have you working 100 hours a week and burning yourself out. You know, it's it's interesting because I've I've heard it said both ways. Uh, traditionally, I even wrote a, a article about this. About you know, I, I was a I was a point guard. You know, I was left handed. Uh, that got figured out you know early in the first quarter of ball games when people mm -hmm. started overplaying me left. I became a, a better player when I learned to go to my right, basically mm -hmm. working that area that isn't my strength. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we've got some people who aren't writers. It doesn't mean avoid writing. But the reason why I'm bringing it up, Brian, is because I've actually heard both sides of this argument of uh, just stay in your lane. If you're not a writer, then don't write. Uh, you know, do what you're good at. Mm -hmm. uh, I always 
came from the school that said, no, if, if, if I'm not good at, at leading people, I want to take some management training. I want to, I want to mm -hmm. get better at that. I, it, so I, who's right. And, and I'm, I'm, I've been shot down on that one, by the way, I think that's more of the traditional <laughs> view and right. people are getting a little bit smarter, but where do you stand on that? I think it gets down to what I said a minute ago. And how many CEOs or entrepreneurs do you know that complain about burnout? It's like a whole cottage industry of burnout. The reason they're burning out is because they're trying to do too many things. If you will bring the right people in, let them do their job. And I always say, replace yourself at every level. Like I own a restaurant chain. I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to make drinks. I don't even go to some of these restaurants because I put the right people in place, which gives me money and lifestyle. I make a little less money, but I have a better lifestyle. So it really, if I don't think anybody started their business to work 100 hours a week and get burned out and miss their family. That's not why we start businesses. We start businesses with this grand idea that I'm going to have a successful business, make a lot of money, have time with my family. And then we work 100 hours a week because we don't trust our people or we don't bring in the right people to help us. Now, in the beginning of a business, it's different. you got to be everything to everybody. But as you grow that business, and if you want to get it to the point where somebody will buy it, Nobody wants to buy your business if you are the only person that's contributing or you are the key factor or the only person with the knowledge or every single customer knows you personally and they, they're not going to do business with you unless you're there. So you got to build a business that replaces you in every role so that you can walk away one day. That's my theory. Well, I think it's a good theory. I was actually just um, had a guest on recently and we were talking about management training and I had been trained by a company called Zenger Miller. And mm -hmm. it, it broke down uh, training management skills in, I think, 24 different separate skills. But the two that I held on to were recognition for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. The other one was delegation. I think mm -hmm. a lot of managers don't delegate. They don't yep. hand that off because they don't understand that, well, there is a process to do that. You, you don't mm -hmm. just go, well, okay, so I'm going to listen to Brian and here you do it. Okay, get it done. Um, it, it's a little bit more complex than yes, that. It is. And I think getting burned by not following a process to do what you just said makes people run for the hills and then get back into, well, I'll do it myself land. That's you the know? challenge with these types of things, right? So I'm telling you something that's really much more deeply involved than what I'm giving you on the surface level. So you're getting the surface level superficial answer, but there's so much below it, which is what you just said that still needs to get done. This is why you need to bring the mentor or the coach in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, Back to your back to failure. I'm, I'm going to throw a. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've been on a few red eyes. If you're out there <laughs> doing your job. Uh, I, I think it was one of these red eyes. You know, when you're in that, I'm not sure if I even slept. I may have, <laughs> Corey. Uh, but I came up with this definition for wisdom, and my definition is and always has been: wisdom consists of three things. It consists of success. It consists of failure. And it consists of a conscious knowledge of the lessons learned from each. So, yes. um, you know, if all you've been is successful, that's great. I wouldn't necessarily call you wise, but you but sure are lucky and, and right. good. I wouldn't mind trading places with you. And if all you've had is failure, well, my heart goes out to you. Uh, but, but most of us have had a piece of each. It's can we articulate the lesson when we failed? Why? When we succeeded? Why? Yes. And are we being methodically observant about it? Yes. We call this the post failure analysis, right? Mm. So there's this old adage and I see it all the time. And I hear gurus say it, you got to fail to succeed. You got to fail to succeed. The faster you fail, the faster you're going to succeed. And every time I hear it, I cringe Yeah, because failure leads to failure. Learning from failure leads to success. And that's the difference. Back to what I said earlier, you might have to fail 10 times, but if you will learn from each failure, it will create the success that you're looking for down the road. Don't just think I got to fail, fail, fail. That's a horrible thing to do. So yes, learning from that failure is what's going to lead you to where you want to go. Yeah. And um, let me ask you a question. Do you, um, do you keep a journal yourself? I, I do. I, 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 I'm a big list maker, a writer. I'm on city council. I keep a journal of every city council meeting we're in. I have all my goals laid out. I've got, I can show you goal sheets from the past 10 years and I've got them for the next five years. I keep all that stuff. I'm, I'm the weird guy, Rob. When I get in the shower in the morning and my glass steams up, I write my goals on the glass uh, in the in the steam. And then the next morning I get it's in and I'm right weird. there again. It is weird, but that's, I, I always keep stuff in front of me. Yeah. Always. Well, and you know, it's not like you and I talked about this beforehand, 
but um, I commend you. And I sense that you did because that's really where a lot of this begins to come from. You know, I snuck in the words methodically observant. It's mm -hmm. it's there has to be a method to be observant. We can't just go now, go out there and be observant. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll try, but uh, and that's why a journal is kind of it for me works because yeah. um, and I typically write when I'm leaving on a trip, when I'm coming back on the trip, and um, the rules are if I feel. I have very little to say, then I'll say today I have very little to say, but I don't <laughs> stay off the keyboard because I don't think I have enough to say. Oh, and P.S. Typically, when we don't think we have a lot to say, that's when you say the most important things. Yep. When you think you know exactly what you're going to be writing about, it's actually not all that exciting. It's it's allowing that to just kind of go. But um, I'm impressed with the fact that you do that. And it tells me a lot about you because, again, I think that's where a lot of that for a coach you've got to have some wisdom. And where does the wisdom come from? It's coming from a guy who's not only had a taste of both sides of this apple success and failure, but is, is trying to record that is trying to process it. It's trying to work mm -hmm. it out. It can't keep it in your head. Got right. to get it down somewhere. Yep. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Yeah. And, and a last advertisement for the Brian and Rob journals that we'll be making available. <laughs> uh, you know, I always, another, we call it a whiff them in sales, right? What's in it for me. Um, another whiff them to do what we're talking about here is I actually went into it thinking boy, what I wouldn't give to be able to read what my dad was thinking was yeah. when he was in the wheelhouse, when he was uh, of, of his career, when he was mm -hmm. getting knocked around, when he was getting some victories. Uh, so I've, uh, I've kept them and you know, I've, I let my children see them, but I'm looking forward to reading them myself uh, when yeah. I, when I retire. That was know, the genesis of my whole first book. It started out just a story about your dad. Like, what have I done? Where did it come from? What happened before you were born? And then and, and the more I wrote and people kept reading it for me and proofreading it for me, it, it ended up turning into a whole book. Uh, the genesis of the, or the ending genesis of the book is no matter where you are, no matter what your background is, no matter how hard you think you've had it. You got bad credit, me too. You've had health problems, me too. You got kid problems, me too. You grew up in a bad house, me too. Failed out of high school, me doesn't matter. You can still do anything you want in life. Your, your, your future starts today. Forget all that and move forward. And so that was the genesis of that book. It was just a story for my kids. That's beautiful. Hey, do you have an author's page an on author's Amazon? Page. Oh, yeah, no? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm only mentioning it because, it, you know, folks, go to the author's page. You'll see all of what he's working on, both books. And um, because I'm intrigued by both of them, quite frankly. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, but I'm it. It's so interesting meeting you, Brian, because truly the part that really connects you in my mind is the is the writing is not the book necessarily is the trying to figure, keep figuring things out. And again, may come back, may be back because neither one of us uh, went through school as it wasn't a layup for either one of us. Right. And so we had no choice but to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I always smile and I see people that, uh, you know, are, are, are making their way. And I think they got one thing. I got one thing they don't have. I got a fighter's heart because I because I had to fight just like right. you. Didn't and, have a choice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So bully for us. Uh, who knew? And actually, most of the things you've ever noticed in life, every time you think now this can't possibly be contributing to <laughs> anything that's going to help me moving forward. It not that minute, maybe not that week or or year. Oh my god! It's funny how everything begins to connect, and, Rob, and it's all vital. I can look back at my life at every failure slash disaster and track how that led to where I am today and how it turned out to be a good thing. Yeah. Even in my company today, when things go wrong, I have a, a woman who is one of my senior people, and she's like, "I don't understand why you're not upset about this." And I'm like, "Look, you don't understand." I've had worse happen and it turned into better. My first company collapsed. It turned into something better when my, you know, I, I can just track it all the way through. Now, here's the question I'll ask you. Okay. Oops. Is that because literally every door that closes leads to another door that's open? Or is it because you as a person have the mindset to take that failure, failure and learn from it and move forward? Which yeah. one is it? I think it's door number two. I think it's I and I also meaning I we begin conditioned of I want to figure out what happened there I want to get smarter I want to get wiser I want to use that um, you know this pandemic has not been a party for professional speakers like myself um, and yet you know now I'm you know I'm I'm booked 
th- three, four months in advance right now. That's and awesome. Life is very wonderful and I'm happy. But I will tell you that the pandemic for me, because I'm a very half full guy, I deal with people in sales that are struggling all the time. Mm-hmm. It's kind of tough to look at somebody and say, I, I read about it. It sounds scary. Uh, no, you have to be able to, you, you want to have empathy for another human being. You have to get knocked around a little bit yourself. And oh, by the way, as entrepreneur to entrepreneur, if, if I were looking for characteristics and I wanted to give birth to an entrepreneur, one thing I would be looking for is, can they take a punch? Yes. Uh, you know, can they, because we all take a punch. Can you dust yourself off, spit out a little bit of blood, wipe your mouth mm-hmm. and go forward <laughs> Get up and, and go. until you get knocked around? How do you know? Yep. You're exactly right. hundred percent. hundred percent. If you were, if you were uh, talking to a younger you and you could whisper something in that younger you's ear right now, yep. what, give me a couple of things you tell uh, 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 I'm not even sure what 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 what, what age this we've got easy. to right now, but let's get you out of school and sort of making your way into this world. Yeah, what would you whisper easy. in your ear? You know what? You have a lottery ticket in your pocket. Keep going; it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Just keep going. Yeah. Don't you know what, what was it? Uh, you know, there was a politically incorrect, but uh, I was always a Mike Tyson fan, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I mean, I he had his issues. Like I said, we all we all have a limp. Uh, but I love that quote from Tyson that says every, and I'm going to get close to it. Everybody's brave until they get punched in the face. Exactly. Yep. Uh, that resonates with me. Sometimes you just got to understand that if you just keep going, yeah, it can be okay. Yeah. All right. How about a couple of mentors, uh, that, that helped shape, uh, the Brian will I see today. You know, early on, there was a guy I'm out in park city, by the way, skiing this week. And, uh, one of my early mentors lives out here. His name's Paul Pilzer, and he was a big time speaker and wrote a bunch of books and speaks all over the world. And he uh, he got me launched into this next phase of my life a few years back. I'll, I'll give you a quick story. I sold my company about 10 years ago, and I'm out here in Park City having lunch with him, the Starbucks right down the street. Mm-hmm. And he said, Brian, what are you going to do now? And I said, Paul, I don't know. I, I guess maybe I'll start another business. And he said, why? Do you need the money? And I said, well, no. He goes, what are you passionate about? I said, what do you mean? He said, what are you passionate about? I said, I have no idea. I've been building a business for the last 20 years. I don't even know what passion is. He goes, let me tell you something. If you're going to be happy for the rest of your life, you need to find a passion and you need to find a way to give back to the world that allowed you to have what you have today. And I was like, wow. And it took me another five years before I started writing my first book and realized that I have a passion for writing. Yeah. And then joined city council and, you know, local politics is my way of giving back to my community. So he was one of my early, early mentors. And then after that was my business partner, Steve, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, I struggled in business for a long time until I met him. And he, just by watching him, nothing he said to me specifically, but I just watched him and how he dealt with people and, and the way he was in business and in life. And he inspired me to be a better person, which is something I struggled with early on. If you, you know, if you're a young entrepreneur with a chip on your shoulder and a bad background like me, I was just angry. I was the hammer and everything was a nail and it never served me well because I had an ego problem. And when it was when I met Steve that I realized that I, I wasn't the person I needed to be in order to grow into the person I wanted to be. And so, you know, he helped me tremendously in that area. Wow. It's great. You know, we all have mentors. Um, I mind, I'm, I'm, shout out to Larry DeMoncus, one of my, my Xerox managers who I really <laughs> learned a ton from, but you know, again, the, the key is we have to be receptive to, Yes. To want to listen and um, and know that there are people out there with our best interest at heart uh, who are there to help us. Uh, but sometimes we miss that. So um, I, I I tend to tuck in the, the mentor question about every third interview. I wish I should do it for every interview because um, rarely do I bump into somebody and go, mentor, what's that? <laughs> I don't have a mentor. <laughs> now, there's always somebody there when well, I was going to the left and they got me going to the right. That's, yep. that's important. Dropout multimillionaire, 37 business lessons on how to succeed in business with no money, no education, no clue. We, we can find that on Amazon and any online store, I'm assuming. Yep. Um, and we got uh, Brian's, uh, you can jump to his uh, author's page, maybe see a couple of his books there. Yep. And uh, my audience knows that uh, you only get extra credit when you get the book, read the book 
and post a review on the book. So yes. we're, we're going to do that as well. Um, and, and we want you to get the book because we like them verified. <laughs> so, yep. so, so go get that book. Um, uh, and, um, uh, Brian, give it to me again. How can people, uh, reach out to you, uh, for coaching? Again, back to my website, www.brianwillmedia.com. B-R-I-A-N-W-I-L-L, brianwillmedia.com. You can get me on there. Perfect. Well, I have to tell you, um, really enjoyed the conversation, learned a lot, um, and I am absolutely grateful you had an opportunity to get on this show. Uh, I appreciate it, Rob. You did fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, folks, we'll do it again as well as we can next time. Until then... Stay safe. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com. <laughs>